In this episode of STEMiverse, Marcus and I talk with Jenny Lynch. Jenny wears many colorful hats, and depending on the day, she's a science communicator, a trainer, an educator, and a designer of science kits for toy companies. In this conversation, Jenny shares with us her experiences and lots of actionable advice for science teachers. This is STEMiverse, episode one. Welcome to STEMiverse, the podcast that helps educators become awesome at teaching STEM, be it at home or in the classroom. I am Peter Dalmaris, and with my co-host, Marcus Sharpe, our mission is to bring you the experiences of educators, students, and stakeholders who strive every day to make the teaching and learning of science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and art better. Hi, Jenny, and welcome to STEMiverse. Thank you very much for making the time to talk to me and Marcus. Well, thank you for having me. A pleasure. <laughs> so I would like to uh, get started by asking you to introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about you, and uh, especially what is your relation to teaching? Okay, well, um, I'm a Sydney-based science communicator, so I, uh, I guess my background is in medical physics and science communication. I've worked for many years um, as a science communicator. At the moment, I have three main roles. Uh, the first one is I work part-time on my own business. Uh, I do freelance science communication and I put on live science shows and I do professional development workshops for early childhood educators and I also design science kits for a toy company. So that's one role. A second role I have is that I'm a part-time uh, school education officer at the School, school of Physics at the University of Sydney. Uh, so that's running an outreach program for, mostly for high school students um, and, and what that does is it connects research scientists, mostly astrophysicists, from seven universities across Australia who work for CASTRO, which is an ASC Centre of Excellence for Astrophysics. Uh, so they connect with schools via video conferencing. Um, and my third role, uh, which takes up a lot of my time, is being a parent to my two young children who are four and six. Um, I guess my connection to teaching is that I've worked in science outreach for many, many years. So I started out in medical physics, but then moved into science communication and worked for 10 years de delivering outreach programs for Questacon, the National Science and Technology Centre in Canberra, although I was based in Sydney for most of that time. So I guess my connection with teaching is mostly through science awareness programs and outreach. Well, that's quite extensive experience. So you've basically uh, teach or are involved in teaching people of different ages, and I suppose different uh, skills, if, if, I, if that's the right word, in science. Uh, is that right? So, for example, what would be the youngest child that you have worked with? The youngest child? So when I worked for Questacon, um, I was managing a team of science communicators, communicators to do a, an outreach program for preschool-aged children. So that was called Questacon Science Play, and it toured all over Australia, including to remote Indigenous communities. Uh, so that was running hands-on science play sessions for children and um, professional development for early childhood educators. Does that program still run? Because uh, I think you've moved away from that role now. Yeah, so it continued for a few years after I left Questacon in 2009, but um, unfortunately the program ended um, mid-2013. Um, and following that, I started doing professional development workshops for educators in Sydney and I'm currently working on developing play sessions for Sydney as well for preschools and, and childcare centres so that, that'll be up and running by the middle of this year. So how did you become a science communicator? Did you wake up one day and go I want to become a science communicator or what was the process in you know that coming into being? Yeah, I guess the process was that I, I was interested in science and, and did a, 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 my undergraduate degree at the University of New South Wales in Sydney. So I, I studied medical physics and did honours in medical physics. And I guess I could have taken acad an academic career path and gone on to do a PhD and that sort of thing. But um, I, I went into, I worked as, I guess, a hospital scientist. So I worked in medical physics in the field of radiation therapy and, um, and then did a little bit of work in, as a research assistant in biophysics in the neurophysiology lab. So I tried a couple of different things and it just wasn't quite 
what I needed to make myself happy, I guess. Um, and then I saw this course that the Australian National, National University runs, um, Graduate Diploma in Science Communication. So I did that in the year 2000, uh, which meant moving from Sydney to Canberra for a year, um, joining a team of, there were 15 students in that year's cohort, and we worked closely with Questacon. Um, and we, were, we staffed a program called the Shell Questacon Science Circus. And that program is still running. It's been running for, I think, 25 years now. Um, and it tours all over Australia. So I got to tour Australia doing science shows for schools um, and running public exhibitions of hands-on science exhibits, as well as doing university studies in science communication. So that's, that's really where it started. I mean, I always, always had an interest in music and performance, and this was my in to be able to move from being a physicist, I guess, to being a bit of a performer. Um, and then I went on to work for Questacon for nine years. Oh, cool. Uh, what do they teach you in the communications component of the degree? Like, you got your science down pat. Like, what do they teach you how to use PowerPoint or is it a little bit more involved? I guess the, the face-to-face stuff with schools, um, we, we did quite a bit of training in, you know, verbal communication and getting rid of jargon from your language, speaking in everyday language um, and connect, using everyday objects and connecting the science to the everyday um, to make it, I guess, relevant for school students. Uh, in terms of the more adult-related stuff, we had journalists come and give us workshops. We had um, assignments where we had to, you know, write newspaper articles and that sort of thing. And there was a bit more about science communication in society and how that, you know, the importance of science communication in society. So your your history makes me uh, wonder about those qualities that, uh, in your opinion, necessary for somebody who teaches other people, whether they are young or older, uh, science and engineering, either in a formal setting like a school or informal setting. What are those qualities that you think are necessary for people like that? Um, I think the important thing is, thing is to focus on the student or the audience and to think about how to make it relevant for them and what language is appropriate for their, their age and their level of education. Um, I mean, I've seen it a lot of, uh, quite often in my work with universities when, you know, that someone might be a, an outstanding research scientist and they might be able to communicate really effectively with their peers. But that doesn't necessarily mean they're going to communicate effectively with a group of school students who might be the most passionate school students on the topic that they're talking about. But if they don't cut out the jargon and think about it from the student's point of view, then the message is going to be completely lost. Um, so I think people need to think about what ex- what prior experiences the, the students have, um, what aspects of the science are going to be most interesting and relevant to them and relate it to their everyday life and their everyday experience. I think that's really key, key to effective communication. I've seen that in myself as well. Like I've been teaching at the university level for 15 years. I don't think really, I don't think it makes much difference whether you are teaching at a university or like a primary school. I think your advice is I've experienced and your advice being true at any level. You really need to adapt what you are teaching to the actual audience instead of just following the script of a PowerPoint or a textbook. And uh, I think that's where a lot of us fail in the classroom. Let's say that uh, we've got a teacher who feels very comfortable with the science side of things. Uh, They know the science, but they feel that they need some additional help in being able to communicate what they know to the students. Um, Do you think that there is a program perhaps in Australia uh, in a university or some other kind of organization that they can use or they can follow in order to improve themselves in the day-to-day teaching of science? So I know there are a lot of, um, you know, universities tend to have teaching programs for academics so they can improve their, their, their teaching skills. Uh, but an excellent example of science communication is Alan Alder's center in the U.S. So he uses a lot of um, improvisation, which is really an traditionally an acting technique um, to help scientists be more spontaneous and and to be really good at listening and to really think about 
um, the way they're communicating science. So, I mean, that's in the US. He has visited, I know he was out here last year for the World Science Festival, um, and somewhere like the Centre for Public Awareness of Science in Canberra, um, they, they also run programs. And, I mean, that's where I, I studied science communication, but they also, um, I know, offer short courses or they, they can, they have um, people who can come into organisations and run training programs. So, yeah, what tips, tools, tricks do you use on a daily basis that another teacher might be able to borrow and use? Um, it could be cool apps that you know of. Uh, it could be a website. I know I'm going off base here and we uh, haven't given you a heads up on this one. Okay, well, I mean, in terms of the tools I use when I'm teaching, I, I like things to be very visual. So whether it's uh, doing a, dem- a science demonstration or explaining something with an image, um, I think it's great to, yeah, to have the visual as well as the talk. Um, in terms of my science shows I use humor and um, costumes and get the audience involved and that sort of thing Um, so professional development for adults I do use PowerPoint when I have to but I also use demonstrations and hands-on activities so getting the participants actively involved um, I think that's really important Um, in terms of apps I guess uh, yeah I mean I I don't use apps a lot in teaching I've used uh, I think it's Kahoot for you know, quick um, quizzes. That's that's quite a fun one to use because you can get the the audience to respond straight away and have a bit of a competition between each other. Well, how does it work? What does it do? Uh, each participant needs to have a smartphone. Um, you set up a quiz prior to the session, and the um, participants just go to a website and enter a code, and that gets them into that particular quiz. And then you okay. hit start, and it brings up questions and it, um, all the participants are on their phone answering multiple choice questions and each question is timed. So um, they're competing not only to get the question right but also to answer quickly and at the end it'll bring up the, the, um, the winner of the quiz. So it's a, it can be a fun way to end a professional development session and, the, you know, maybe the, the winner gets a Mars bar or something, I don't know. So that, that's quite a fun one to use. Yeah, I have used something like that uh, at university classes and it does wake people up, like all of a sudden get off Facebook and get on my, like Kahoot. I've, I've used a couple of other similar applications as well and that really make things lively. So I thought let's change gears and talk about kids. And what I'm wondering is your experience in the following. Let's say that you've got a child, maybe 10 years old, who doesn't show much interest in science. What do you do? Well, I, I guess not, not everyone's going to have and in a interest and aptitude in science, like I'm not expecting every student in an audience or in a classroom to go on to be a scientist. But I think a 10-year-old child, there has to be something that connects their interest to science, I think. Um, just to give you an example of something I've worked on recently, uh, I've been developing science kits. As I said, I've designed science kits for a toy company and I recently finished developing a pirate science kit. So... You know, I read, went back and read Treasure Island and got ideas of things to include. So in, in using the kit, the student, uh, the child, they're not really at school doing this, not really something you do at school, but, you know, they go through various activities related to pirates, but there's also a lot of science in there as well. Um, for example, they make uh, an oil cloth and make a treasure map and wrap up the treasure map in the oil cloth and then put it in water and see how it makes the cloth waterproof. And they make a little air cannon and learn about air pressure. So it's playing, but it's also discovering by doing and, and learning about science at the same time. So I guess, again, it comes back to the student. It comes back to the child and finding out what their, their interests are and making the science relevant to them. I do find a similar experience with my own kids. Um, the, one problem that I have is that there's a lot of competition for the time. Like kids today are not like kids 10 or 20 years ago. There's just so many other things that they could be doing. So very often the, uh, the problem for educators, parents, teachers, is just to find out what clicks with the children, uh, where the interest lies. I'd like to, to switch gears again now, Jenny, and talk about art. How do you think that art relates to both the way that 
people and kids in specifically learn. And with STEM, science and technology uh, and engineering in particular, how can we use art to strengthen our ability to teach and our ability to learn? Well, it's interesting you say that because I know the, the, this term STEM gets thrown around a lot. And I think, you know, science, technology, technology, engineering, mathematics are all very important, but it's also vital not to neglect the arts. I think they're a very important part of being human and, and a very important part of creativity, which is, of, of course, important for STEM and, you know, for design and, and problem solving and coming up with new ideas. Um, I feel very fortunate in my current line of work that I, I get to use not just my background in science, but also I've also always had an interest in drawing and, um, and music. So I can use those in the science shows I develop and also in the product development I do. You know, I might be drawing a magic wand that's going to have a crystal on the end of it or, you know. Um, and art is the ultimate in creativity. You know, you have the freedom of expression and, and that leads to new ideas. And if, if that's put alongside an engineering project where you're trying to solve a problem, come up with new ideas, and that's that's fantastic, you know. Um, so I think ways of actually including art in STEM, um, I, there's, a, there's a whole lot of different things you could do, whether it's asking students to do a particular design project, whether, you know, designing a chair or designing even a planetarium and taking the aesthetics into account as well as, the functionality of an object. Um, yeah, sorry, that's a bit vague, but um, just to bring it back to my personal experience, um, I think le- learning the process of creativity, I mean, children are often naturally creative and as adults, adults sometimes we lose that. So it's making sure we don't lose that and giving students the freedom to and the permission to be creative. I think as students move through from primary school to secondary school, they become more self, self-conscious self about uh, their artistic abilities or their drawing abilities. And, and if they're, they're made to feel that that's an important part of not just an artistic pursuit, but also creativity for, for a more STEM-related pursuit, then perhaps they'll keep that spontaneity and the creativity they had as a child. Yeah, I think you touched on a very important topic as, uh, as I'm, I'm looking at my kids as they're going through the different uh, stages of you know, early child um, education. There's a lot of art in the things that they do in uh, the day-to-day activities at school. And I see that slowly disappearing. As, so as they grow older and they progress through the different classes, there's this less and less drawing, there's less dancing, less playing around and education then becomes more rigid and uh, com- compartmentalized. Uh, do you think that this is some kind of uh, public policy that potentially somehow sometime in the future could change? And that by that I mean uh, to introduce a lot more art in our schools at later classes? Yeah, well, I guess uh, art is not compulsory beyond year eight, I don't think. So from year nine, Students don't have to study visual art as such. Um, I guess if if schools are really taking STEM as it, I think it's intended, which is a cro- cross curriculum program where you're including science, technology, engineering, and maths, then art could be brought into that as well. Um, but that takes that takes a whole school approach, and it means breaking down the silos that exist in the curriculum. I mean, getting science, technology, engineering, and maths to work together is one challenge, so bringing in the arts as well, that just adds another layer. I'm, I'm, I'm a bit pessimistic about that, become, yeah. about art becoming more prominent in the, in the, in, in the way the, I guess the curriculum is, is structured at the moment. Is the breaking down of the silos actually happening in what you've seen within the schools? Uh, I know with the, the New South Wales Department of Education have been working with particular schools to implement STEM programs. I don't know a lot about the details of those, but I know that okay. it is happening, yeah. Cool. So a totally random, non segued question. I'd love to know more about your product development, seeing as you you build uh, kits and toys. Like, what's your process there and how does that work? So I work for um, an Australian-based company um, and the, the products are actually made in 
Taiwan. Uh, I guess my main part of the process is the concept development. So I pitch ideas to the company and if they take on the ideas, then my job is to work with their R&D team to develop the, the details of what actually goes in the box, what um, it could be designing a magic wand, like I said, or, you know, working out exactly what quantity of a product we can include in the kit. Uh, I also write the promotional text that goes on the box and in the advertising. I write, And a big part of my job is writing the instructional booklet, so the instructions that go with it. Um, so that's doing a, a rough layout and getting all the words right. Um, I've also written the, st done the storyboarding and scripting for TV commercials for the UK. Um, so a whole lot of things in the process. Um, and it's, it's great fun, like working with, with people in Taiwan in their R&D team. Um, I'm sitting in Sydney and I'm emailing them and working out all the, the finer details of what's going to go in this product. Um, and of course, the focus is always on the child who's going to use it. So mm -hmm. trying to step into their shoes and see what, what's going to be really fun for them and what science we can include. Because as well as being a fun toy and a fun experience, there also has to have has to be some science in there as well. That's awesome. This is what you do. But how do you do it? How do you go and do the pitch? How do you, like, do, do they come to you and say, hey, we've got this, uh, you know, slot in our marketing or in our hmm. product mix that we want to fill? Would you have an idea of what we could fill it with? Do they have a budget? Or it's a bit a of a mixture. So a bit of a mixture. So some of it is me just coming up with a fresh idea, um, but there's also a bit of feedback from them about what direction they want to go, where they want more products. Um, yeah, and in terms of coming up with those ideas, I'm working with the style that they've al already developed over the past 15 years with their product lines, but trying to come up with fresh ideas. So using the, say, some components that they already have in their products and using, using them in a different way. For example, I, um, there's a product on the market at the moment that I developed called the Cake of Soap Factory. So it's using um, melt and pour soap to make cupcake shapes and meringues and things. And, I mean, there's a lot of science that we talk about in the instruction book about, you know, melting and freezing and whipping up a stable foam. And the, I guess the, the key process I added to that kit was whipping up a foam. So they take the glycerin soap in the kit and add a bit of water and melt the, melt the soap and whip air through it. And that creates this stable foam that the children can then pipe onto their soap cakes like buttercream frosting. So, mm -hmm. um, so that was a new idea that I pitched to them and fortunately they took that one up and, and that's been going really well. And then, you know, I mentioned the pirate science kit. So that was me thinking what, could, you know, just trying to think outside the box and think what can I draw on to get some, some unique ideas. So I'm always looking for ideas, you know, if, whether it's wandering through a toy shop and looking at what's already there or playing with my kids and mucking around with materials, just, you know, Ideas can come in a really laboured way where I'm thinking I really need to have a chemistry kit. I really need to think of what that's going to be and doing a whole lot of background research. Or it can be sitting on the bus and just having an idea and in 10 minutes I've, I've, I've come up with a list of five activities that could go into a kit. So I guess it's like any sort of creative, pro creative process. The, it's giving yourself the time to think of the ideas as well as um, being open to the fact that some ideas won't go anywhere, you know, like I could spend a week working on an idea and then realize this, this just isn't going to work. Let's move on to something else and start afresh. How do you go about prototyping an idea once it's once it's gone and said, well, do you prototype ideas or how does this work? I, proto I do rough prototypes that I share via YouTube or, um, or I go into, into the office um, there with the Sydney-based people. Uh, so I just use whatever I have. Or, you know, I get suppliers in, in Australia that um, can source materials for me or the, the people in Taiwan source materials sometimes as well. So I just put together a rough prototype and then then the R&D people will put together a more more complete sort of prototype. And as you mentioned, you're generating text. Uh, are you creating other media that's going online? or? Well, I, I write the instruction books and I write the scripts for the... There, there are YouTube videos to demonstrate the products as well as okay. some TV commercials. So 
I don't produce those, but I, I, I do the storyboarding and, and write the scripts and that sort of thing. And um, what's your script writing process? How do you get into the zone in, in order to be able to uh, you know, get the words onto the paper? By the time I'm at the, the stage of writing a TV commercial or a YouTube video script, I've been, I'm very close to the product, so I've been working on it for months. Um, and I've already written the instruction book, so it's not that hard to get in the zone in a way. Like I just sort of, okay, we want to get across, I think about what we want to communicate to the audience. We want to show them all of the activities you can do in this kit and um, find a visual way of showing that. That's where the storyboarding comes in. I just do rough sketches of what I want to see in the video and then write a voiceover script that goes with that. And a lot of that content will be drawn from the promotional text that I've already written. So, you know, the text that goes on the box or on the website. So there's, you know, it's coming up with um, engaging advertising copy that, you know, that goes into the website and the catalog as well as the, the, um, the online videos as well. Do you test your copy on family and friends or how do you know when you've hit gold? <laughs> uh, well, I, I test it on my husband. He's my editor. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's very helpful. Um, and it's just, I mean, I've, I, I guess I've, I've been writing scripts and things for a long time. So I guess from practice you get the hang of finding finding words that work together. And then I, the, the people I work with in the toy company, they're always giving me feedback and they might, you know, decide they want something worded slightly differently. So we'll have a bit of back and forth there as well. I just wonder, Jenny, after having uh, the, the process that you use to create new educational products, uh, is is this a market that is growing? And by that I mean uh, the the kids science kit or engineering kit market, uh, which the way I understand it predominantly is used by households. So parents buy kits for the kids uh, to play around with uh, chemistry and um, uh, doing a, some reactions or building a robot in a kit. Do you think that that market is increasing? To be honest, I don't know. Where I sit in the industry is, you know, as the, I guess the creative input, I'm not really across the, the international industry in, in terms of science kits, science kits, I'm afraid. I just, yeah. I just get the sales, sales figures for the ones that I design. Uh, the reason I ask is I'm trying to get a gauge uh, about uh, how much education happens outside the classroom using products, materials that people can readily find on the internet, perhaps, or in, uh, in retail sure, yeah. shops. And I suppose that your products, your, your kits uh, are sold over the internet. And they will be very interested to know how many of those end up, say, in a classroom, and then how many of those would, be, uh, would end up at a kitchen bench at a household or where the parents would play around with the kids. So the kits I designed would mostly be end up in households rather than school rooms. Uh, they're very much marketed in that way. Yeah, so it might be a Christmas present or a birthday present, that sort of thing. So there's very much the fun aspect as well as the science. So although there is the educational element, the idea is that, you know, you're not hitting the kids over the head with that. You're not sort of making that stand out as the main aim of doing the kit, if that makes sense. Yeah, it's more like a toy. <laughs> it's not a lesson, right? You can't use that word. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, school curricula are so specific in terms of what they do and when things happen. Um, unless you're designing a product specifically for that. Um, and I know the company I've, I work for has, has done that sort of thing in the past, developed things for a school market. And it, that's a tough market, you know, it's very specific. And the Australian market is quite small. It's difficult to develop something that would be viable for Australian schools. Okay. And how many times have you given your kits as a gift? <laughs> well, <laughs> it's funny you should ask that because they've been on sale in the UK. The first two kits that have been on sale went on sale in the UK last year. Yeah. Uh, so I only got my hands on the first finished product just um, at the end of last year. Um, so I've only given one as a gift. I gave to my cousin's daughter for Christmas. <laughs> Did she like it? I, I, I don't know if she's done it yet. I'm going to have to ask her because, you know, I saw her at Christmas and I'll have to get some feedback. 
there, there have been some you, there's a there's a great YouTube review of my cupcake soap kit. It's like an unboxing, and then the presenter does the kit. And I mean, it's great free advertising having <laughs> these YouTubers out there reviewing products. So as long as the reviews are good, and this one was, so I was happy with that. <laughs> so uh, we are mindful of your time, Jenny. So how about we go into some rapid fire questions? <laughs> I'll try to keep that, say, five minutes. Sorry, Peter, can I just clarify by rapid fire? You just want really quick responses from me on these ones? Our questions will be really quick. Uh, your responses don't, don't have to be that quick. You can take uh, more time uh, if you need. Uh, we, we try to phrase the questions so that also your answers are quick. But as I said, you, you don't have to be quick. It's you more, take your time. we won't pick apart your responses. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so we try not to digress too much. If you, if you say something interesting, we try not to interrupt you. Say, oh, tell me more about that. We'll try to stick to the script <laughs> for this one. Okay. So I'd like to know about who, if anyone, has been the most influential person in shaping the way that you teach. Okay. I'm going to cheat and say lots of people. So I'd say the audiences I've presented shows to, um, which have mostly been primary school students. Uh, and, you know, presenting to a group of 120 year three students, for example, you can't lose your attention for a second. You know, you've got to keep on, on to keeping them engaged and keeping them involved. Um, so that was, that's been a big lesson, presenting tens of thousands of science shows to that sort of audience. Uh, but the second one would be the team that I, that I managed in Sydney when I worked for Questacon. So I had a team of science communicators I worked with. And I guess I, I had to train them and I did professional development with them. Um, and I learned so much from them. Uh, some of them were classroom teachers before they worked for Questacon. And, yeah, I learned a lot about how to present information to different people. Every, everyone learns differently. And working one-on-one -on -one with adults in that setting taught me a lot about how to communicate with people. Great. Cool. The next rapid-fire question is, what app can you not live without? I'd have to say Google Apps. Okay. Yeah, so Gmail and Calendar, and I just use that all the time it, for business and for just organising myself for, for, my, for my business and teaching and everything. What advice would you give to educators just starting out? I would say find a mentor. Find someone you can relate to who uh, is willing to give you some of their time. And it doesn't have to be a lot of time, but I know I've recently been speaking to some early career teachers who've gone into schools you know, they've just come out of uni. They're so keen to do well and to teach well and to learn on the job, you know, because learning to study teaching at university is the first step. Actually getting in there and doing it is where you really learn to teach from my understanding. Unfortunately, the experiences I've heard of recently, um, these, these young people have not had the support they should have in schools. You know, they've asked more experienced teachers for support and feedback and that hasn't been forthcoming and I think that's a real shame and a real loss that this enthusiasm and these bright educated teachers aren't getting the support they need so if they need to seek out that one person who's going to be their champion and and answer their little questions when they need a bit of support and pick them up when they've had a bad day so I think that's I guess it's important in any any industry to find a more experienced person who can who can give you advice and support. Yeah, that's so true in everything, isn't it? Like a mentor can make a, a huge difference in in people's lives, especially people that are just starting out in a new field. Um, great. Uh, another one would be, I'd like to know what your favorite teaching book is, so teaching relating book. If you have one. If you have one, yeah. I yeah. don't really have one, but a favorite book of mine from university was a book called The Art of Electronics. And I guess I'm thinking about that because we were talking about art and STEM and everything. I don't know if you've read, have you, have you, either of you read that book? Uh, I've got it on my bench. It's <laughs> yes. on littlebirdelectronics.com. <laughs> so it was, you know, when I was studying electronics in second and third year uni, studying physics, um, it's just such a, a quirky book that, you know, it has a good sense of humor and it talks about electronics being an art, you know, that... <laughs> Yes, it's an amazing book. Things don't always work and you have to try again. And I mean, I haven't opened the book for years, but um, they really got me interested in electronics and I did a little bit of that in my early career. So that would be it, The Art of Electronics. 
Thank you for reminding me of that book. I'm, I'm going to go and check it out later <laughs> as well. <laughs> How do you get in front of 300 year three <laughs> students and uh, feel okay about teaching a presentation? Uh, I guess that comes from, from two things. One is practice, but the, the one you do before the practice is preparation. Um, so knowing your topic really well. And if you're presenting in a, front of 300 year three students, it's practicing the material and knowing it back to front and inside out and also being able to improvise. So with a live audience, you always have to um, expect mm -hmm. the unexpected. So students answering questions in ways you didn't expect or just calling something random out in the middle of a show and being able to respond to that, being open to it and, and having fun with it. Okay, I've got a controversial question for you. What is the worst age group to teach? <laughs> Uh, the worst audience I've had would be year nine, I have to say. It's very difficult. Um, I mean, I, I shouldn't separate high school from adults, really. Later high school audiences are very similar to adult audiences. That You know, they'll sit and they'll look and they'll listen, but they won't give you a response unless you work really hard for it, unless your material is is, is really going to hit their mark and make them give you a response. Younger children are much more open to just being spontaneous and giving you a response and being open to things. So, yeah, I think that the older people get, the harder they are, <laughs> to be honest. Yeah, Although early childhood educators are a great audience. They're, you know, they're used to being in front of young children and singing songs with them and being spontaneous with children. So I think they've either kept or gone back to that um, ability to play um, and if you've got an audience who's willing to play with you I think that's a lot more fun. That's very interesting so suppose uh, maybe it makes sense for any teacher to be a teacher of uh, kids say before 10 years old and get that experience of of the audience being spontaneous and therefore them becoming more spontaneous and hopefully that sticks over the long term. You know I mentioned Alan Older how he works with scientists and uses improvisation. And I guess that's his, his idea is improvisation exercises, which are traditionally acting exercises. They really just bring you back to being able to play, to playing with ideas and playing with other people and responding to other people and being open to what someone else says and, you know, all of that. I think you can get through through those sort of exercises as, as well as just being around young children as well. So you, you must prepare. So I'm just taking lessons from you, Jenny. You must always prepare, but improvise. Does that make sense? <laughs> well, the thing is, you, if, if you're well prepared and you've got a good foundation, you that gives you the, the freedom to be able to improvise. Because you know, once you finish that little improvisation, you, you're landing back on some solid material that you know, you know where you're going next. What PD or professional development have you found the most useful in the last year? Well, I've been quite lucky in the past year that I've, in my part-time role at the University of Sydney, I've been presenting at Science Teachers Association conferences all over Australia. So I've been to five, I think, in the past 12 months. So I've been a presenter, but I've also been um, able to participate in, in workshops and, and interact with teachers, and that's been great, just talking to teachers from all over Australia and, and hearing from, from the other presenters at the conferences. Any that stick out? In particular, any that were just awesome? There's, I mean, there's, there's been some presenters from overseas talking about the scientific method. Um, I, I think those sorts of things just makes you, brings you back to, you know, what, what are we doing with teaching young people about science? Um, we need to come back to what is science and what are the key things we want them to learn. And I think for me, one of those important things is the scientific method and what separates science from other disciplines. Um, and it's you know, being methodical and being questioning and, you know, only changing one variable in an experiment. You know, those fundamental things that even when I'm, you know, I'm writing some new science shows this year and I really want to put more of that back into it, um, really communicate to children what makes science different to other ways of thinking and why it's important. If there's one conference that a teacher should go next year, which one should it be if you have one in mind? You know, something that I've, I've, I've learned working at the University of Sydney over the past 18 months is the value of going back and sitting in on 
um, the colloquium that are held at colloquia that are held at the university. So as a as a physics major originally, you know, it had been a while since I'd sat in a university lecture theatre and heard about the latest research directly from the person who's doing the research rather than reading a research paper. And for teachers, that's something they can do. You know, uh, universities aren't always that great at advertising them, but um, there's certainly public lectures as well as colloquia that are held in the various disciplines. Um, and I think there's a lot of value in if there's, if there's a topic a teacher is really interested in, go and sit in the audience and take the... I know teachers are really pushed for time, but to go and sit and, and listen to a few lectures. I mean, some of them are online as well. I think there's a lot of value in that um, to get back to the, the, the actual people who are doing the research. We're the ones talking to students about it. We're not the ones who are actually conducting the research. So getting in touch with real scientists, I think, is quite important. So teachers should become students occasionally at least and sit in their students' shoes in a way. Yeah, and I, I mean, I think it's important for teachers to keep their, in, in becoming students, for teachers to keep their spark of interest alight as well. You know, if, if you're sitting there hearing about the latest discoveries in cosmology or in photonics or, you know, that might get you fired up to then go into the classroom and fire up your students about this stuff that they're learning in the classroom, which they might not see the point of sometimes. If you can help them see the point of it, then they're going to enjoy it a lot more. Because it's a, a big difference between STEM subjects and other subjects, right? That STEM typically changes, like there's discoveries happening constantly, there's uh, new uh, updates in the body of knowledge, so those somehow should be able to trickle down to the teachers that deliver all this knowledge to the students. So it's a good way of staying in touch. So Jenny, uh, we really appreciate your time today and we're, we're gonna have to wrap it up soon. But before we do, do you have any parting thoughts for our listeners, any do's or don'ts or anything to look out for? Uh, I think I sort of touched on it earlier, but the, I think it's good to be mindful that this term STEM gets thrown around a lot and sometimes it loses its meaning. Like, I think the intended meaning is that cross-curricular approach to, to teaching, um, integrating subjects and giving them more real-world re relevance and having project-based learning. You know, I, I just read recently an article written by a teacher that said, if you're teaching science, then you're teaching STEM. Well, not really. I'm, I, I think it's teaching STEM as an integrated subject is a great idea and it can work sometimes. But I think it's also important to remember that STEM is for separate disciplines and taking science as an example, we still need to recognise the importance of fundamental basic science and that science is, has, has things about it that technology, engineering, maths don't and the same with the other, the other topics. So I think that's just a parting thought that STEM isn't everything, you know, it's, it's an idea but science and technology and engineering and mathematics are all very important disciplines on their own as well. If you represent a company, perhaps your own, if you have any special offers, if you want to say something about the company's activities, its products, then please do so. Well, so my, my company is Creative Science. I have a website if anyone's interested in looking at that. Um, if you want to contact me, it's jenny at creativescience.com.au. Uh, uh, it's for any early childhood educators. There, there are some free activities. In, on the, in the resources section of my website. So you're welcome. There's about 18 different hands-on science activities for children. So, And keep an eye out if you're interested in the play session because we'll be, start doing those in the middle of 2017. Oh, that's great. Do you also have a YouTube channel or a blog perhaps where people can look you up, Twitter, Facebook? Okay, so people can follow me on Facebook and I also have a, a Twitter account if you look for Jenny Lynch, J.L. Lynch. That's my Twitter handle. Got it. And we'll link to them from the show notes. Well, thank you very much for uh, your time, Jenny, and uh, your experience and answering all of sometimes annoying questions. <laughs> I appreciate that. Um, and okay. um, we wish you all the best for the future. Thank you. Bye. Great. Thanks so much. So good to talk to you. That's all for this episode. If you have any questions or suggestions, please send them to our email address, questions at stemiverse.com, and we'd be happy to answer them. 
Do you want us to interview someone in particular? Let us know. Visit us at stemiverse.com to get the show notes of every episode. And subscribe on iTunes by searching for the name of our podcast, Stemiverse. That is S-T-E-M-I-V-E-R-S-E. Thanks for listening and we'll see you next time.